Let's do this. The first two questions are questions. The next six or five are going to be case studies. Okay? We're going to put the case up here, right? Okay. We're going to put the case up. I'm going to allow you time to read the case, and then I'll deal with the case, and then we will leave it open for discussion. Is that okay? So we'll leave. Please, everybody, uh, this is not the time for you to be quiet. Okay? Uh, it's, <laughs> it's time for you uh, to respond. To, if there's a question you have, it's better for you to ask me than to leave this place with a question. Even if you've spoken three, four times, don't worry about that. Okay? It's an opportunity for us to do that today. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's uh, put the first question up for today. Now, I have to say, that just to give you the background to this, the person that wrote this uh, said that uh, she has a friend, and the friend, uh, this basically came through Facebook interaction. Um, the friend says that she wants to go to church, but she is so confused with so many translations of the Bible and uh, so many denominations and everything like that, but that she had gone to a bookstore to buy something, and she saw a book on demonology and witchcraft that was written by King James I. Sometimes you will see King James I or King James IV, okay? And there's a reason for that because King James was the one that actually combined the Scottish kingdom with the uh, old kingdom became the United Kingdom. Okay? So, um, the history of King James was, I believe he was the youngest king to ever serve the British people. He became king at the age of 16. Uh, he grew up without father or mother. The father died... Uh, uh, long before uh, he was uh, delivered, and the mother was imprisoned by I Elizabeth, uh, who uh, for some reason has something against uh, King James' mother, and imprisoned her, and later on, uh, yeah, how did they call it? executed her. Uh, but King James had an uh, opportunity to, to converse with, uh, with his mother while he was in prison. Uh, if you know the history of the British Empire, uh, one person was in my Baptist history this past uh, semester, and uh, we studied how the Baptist people came into existence, and our existence uh, goes all the way back to Holland and to the uh, British uh, Kingdom. Um, and uh, even the persecution that happened to Baptists uh, uh, gave us a very hot drink in America that we call Bloody Mary. Uh, Bloody Mary actually came from uh, the drink that they named after Mary the king because he was killing Baptist ministers. And anyone that was not part of the uh, British uh, Church of England or went against the Church of England, and uh, uh, the people of the, the British people gave her the uh, uh, nickname Bloody Mary, and they, they did a drink after her. And of course, America got the, uh, uh, the drink popularized here, uh, mainly because, as you know, America was actually colonized by the British. The, a lot of, if those of you know your American history, uh, in the early 1600s, uh, America was ruled uh, by British and the, uh, 
uh, independence did not come until around 1770-something. Right? Those of you that know your history will follow me a little bit. But, but the point is that King James was probably the most influential king of the British people because uh, he did more for uh, the British people than anyone. And one of the things that he did was commission, and he commissioned the uh, translation of a new English Bible in 1604 to be done, and uh, some scholars said 42 scholars were chosen. Some said 57 scholars were chosen. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, he chose some scholars to translate the what we now call the King James translation. But it has gone through several uh, editions. Uh, he did. It, it, you know, it was not finished until 1611, and when it was finished, it's not the type of King James that you have now. The first King James had the apocrypha with it. Have I lost some of you? Okay. Who, who did I lose? Okay. Uh, yes. Okay, keep going. Okay. Um, but anyway, uh, the King James translation of the Bible became a very, very popular Bible. Now, if you, I want to give you a little bit of history because a lot of the the question that was asked, it's really important to know the history, okay? Uh, when, when I call him King James, so we don't have confusion. When he was growing up, he had a scholar that was his teacher, uh, what they would call his tutor. His tutor taught him uh, he could speak uh, Greek fluently. He spoke Latin. He was able to speak French. Uh, he was able to speak German. And uh, in fact, in his uh, governmental relationship with other countries, he didn't need any interpreter. Whatever country he was uh, do, dealing with, he knew how to speak their language. So he knew that the English translation that they had was not a good one. So that was why he commissioned uh, for the scholars to translate another English uh, Bible that became probably the most popular English Bible till today. Uh, many of you know that I don't like the King James translation, but it's not because of King James. It's because that it did not follow the best available manuscripts when it was translated. Remember that even the Dead Sea Scrolls were not discovered until 19 what? 1947, okay? So uh, they didn't have the opportunity to have some of the best uh, manuscripts, at least for the Old Testament that was available uh, in doing it. And if you know a little bit about what we call textual criticism, Textual criticism is actually the science to help you determine which text you have in front of you is the closest test to the original writings of the authors of the Bible. Since we don't have any writing available, uh, textual critics have to figure out through what we call textual criticism, which is the best, best text to the original. Uh, Tini, are you still with me? I want to make sure you get the point. Okay, so th the point is that we have the King James translation. It's a good thing. It's a good thing that was done. Okay, in the time that King James grew up, it actually it started before him in the late 1500s. The, the people in area of the European countries were very, very fascinated with demons and witchcraft. And King James happened to be one of them. In fact, uh, how many of you know this song? A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. How many of you familiar with it? Who else? Yes. Okay. That, was, that song was written by Martin Luther. 
Martin Luther was also very uh, from, uh, attracted and uh, influenced by demonology. So that was how King James wrote a book on demonology and witchcraft. Um, and basically the question that the friend was asking on Facebook is how can a person who is noted for translating the King James translation be also noted for writing a book on demonology and witchcraft? Okay, the reason why is because in that time, nearly everybody was fascinated by demonology and witchcraft. So the book that King James wrote was basically to help people to understand the world of the occult and demonology and witchcraft as it relates to the message of the Bible. It's written in such uh, old English that many of us cannot read it. In fact, I, I made most of my students in history to go read original writings in the 1500s, and many of them cannot make them out. Because they, even though they were English, the spellings have changed, and the way they wrote were different. Uh, but there's a guy that has translated some of uh, King James' uh, works, and that's why you see it now in bookstores today, where they have it. But it was not a book that was teaching people how to worship demons or teaching people how to uh, do witchcraft. Actually, uh, King James uh, persecuted more people that they suspected were witches. They brought it all the way to America, and it was very popularized in Massachusetts where people were actually burned at stake for being suspected to be witches. And that is the influence, the British influence that was brought in uh, to America. Yes. <laughs> I would say, uh, personally, uh, uh, there are a lot of issues we're going to deal with today that are going to help us in that area. I did not know him personally. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I would say from everything that I have read, he knew who Jesus Christ was and he was committed to Jesus Christ, committed enough to make it, believe me, um, it's, it's a really fascinating history because the Catholic Church tried to kill him. In fact, one of the Jesuits people that was uh, uh, assigned to bomb him and the parliament was caught in the basement with the powder, uh, gunpowder still uh, being put together. Uh, of course, they were all uh, hanged. Uh, but the reason why the Catholic Church didn't want him was the Catholic Church did not want people to read the Bible. The Catholic Church wanted the Pope to be the head. Of course, in, in Britain, it was different. The king is the head. And the church cannot rule the king. The king rules the church. Okay, so uh, they tried to kill him because he wanted to make the Bible available to every person so everybody can read. Uh, I, but... You know, let me read something for you, uh, something that he wrote. That way you can make your own decision. But I believe he was a Christian. Uh, get my hand on it right away. He said, he said this. This is my advice to my son. Diligently read his word and earnestly pray for the right understanding thereof. Search the scriptures, saith Christ, for they will bear testimony of me. 
The whole scripture, saith Paul, are profitable to teach, to improve, to correct, and to instruct in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect unto all good works. And he wrote again, he said, The whole scripture containeth but two things, a command and a pro prohibition. Obey in both. The worship of God is wholly grounded upon the scripture, and it quickeneth by faith. Uh, there are a lot of other things that he said, but, you know, uh, definitely uh, many of us will have problem with the way the Church of England operated the, the uh, church. Uh, here we believe that the church should be free from government. There the government controlled the church. And uh, the king was the head of every church in England. Uh, you mean no I'm not I'm not sure I understand your point not in England you know there is if you go to England today it's not just the Church of England that is in you're in, in England and even in all of Europe, you know. You have, you now have Baptist churches. You have Pentecostal churches. Uh, you have uh, uh, the Church of England, of course. Uh, you have the Catholic Church. Uh, that, um, when did that become possible? The, the, uh, the authority for people to just have their own church and their own freedom. I'm giving you a test here. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, yeah. In, in 1705, it was made possible that you can, you can become, you, you can be what you want. You don't have to subscribe to the Church of England. So, the Illuminati things, that's a little bit complicated. Yeah. It's a little bit complicated, and some of it are actually... Uh, made up with mythology than it is facts, you know. And, and you have basketball players now, and different people think they're part of the Illuminati, you know. So, uh, but, but anyway, the point is this. The point is that what King James did, even though it was not his intention to free the people from the Church of England under the rule of the king, he actually provided the Bible for the average person to read. And because it provided the average person to read, it actually strengthened the reformation of the church that started late in the 1500s. Was championed by Martin Luther. Yes. So why would it have to be the Church of England that controls the church? Because the Church of England is not the Church of England? Well, I guess you could say that, but he is the head of the Church of England. Yeah, he was... He was the head of the Church of England. Yes. Yes. Is Uh huh. When King James, remember now, these successive kings. King James was the one that united the kingdom together. You know, so. Well, all the kings before him, even even King James himself, uh, wanted the Church of England to be the church. That was what the Catholic Church was fighting for a long time. You know, so there was really no king that said, uh, you are free of us and we're not in charge. All the kings of England were in charge of the churches. 
And, and the reason why you have empty churches in England and Europe today, it's not because of the kings. It's, it's because that uh, there's a new movement. People, people don't just want to go there and sit down. And because the, the Catholic Church is sort of uh, similar to the Anglican Church and to the Church of England, you know, they are very, very uh, methodical, uh, uh, ritualistic, and there is no freedom of spirit. You know, I saw some people came in and they were dancing and singing, and then I looked around, they were gone. I hope nobody told them to leave. Huh? Okay. You know, because this is this is the way our church is. Come and worship. You know, it doesn't it doesn't matter. You know, some of us don't want to dance. Let the person want to dance, dance. You know? Uh let the person want to raise their hand, raise their hand. We're not in the Church of England. You know? <laughs> We're not in the Catholic Church. We're in a free church in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we should allow people to worship God the way God wants them to worship. But it must be, you know, orderly, of course. You know, we don't want you coming here and eating hamburger and dancing. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me, though? Oh, okay, good. All right. Uh, so is that, is that, okay, I believe that uh, uh, he was a Christian. And uh, that's all I can say. Like I said to you, I don't know him. I can only go by what I read and what I studied about him. But uh, um, there are a lot of people that uh, led the church, ruled the church, whether it be Anglican church, whether it be Baptist, whether it be uh, Methodist, whether it be Catholic, that you probably don't think they're Christian. Yes. Sometimes Cheryl doesn't think I'm a Christian. But anyway, Pastor, um, <laughs> she teases me. Um, so he wrote the book. I guess that's the point. Yes. So as far as the question on Facebook, he wrote the book. Yes, he did. Okay. He wrote the book. Uh, yes, that's you. not the only book he wrote. He was a prolific writer. It's one of the books he wrote. Uh, and uh, it, it, again, it's not to teach people how to become witch, witches or to teach people something about demonology, but to protect people from and to expose uh, demonology and compare it with the Bible. You know? He was a serious Bible student. There was no doubt about that from all of the historical facts we have. Okay, let's go to question number two. How will you deal with a man and woman who have had 30 years of friendship that seems pure and loving without any romantic overtones? And the man gets married and a few months after revealed to his friend of over 30 years that he has always had romantic feelings for her. <laughs> uh, well, Alfredo wrote a song. He said, when you get to heaven, keep your $100 bills. It's not going to work there. Okay? If you're going to use it, use it right here. When you get to heaven, it's too late to pray. You should be praying here. Okay? The point of it, of the whole thing is this. Um, and I don't have any specific scripture to back what I'm saying, but the whole of scripture, the tone of the Bible, and the way the Bible wants us to relate to one another. Okay? If somebody is married... and you want to say something to them, make sure, as a Christian, I'm not only talking to Christians, make sure it's something that you can say in front of their wife 
or in front of their husband. If you cannot say it in front of their wife and in front of their husband, it's a sure sign that it's not appropriate. Somebody say something? Okay. So, uh, that's really important. If you had a relationship with somebody for over 30 years, you never express to that person that you love them. You never express to them that you have any feelings for them. And then they got married. You knew when they were engaged, right? Is it time to speak up? I'm sort of interested. And the person can say, well, I'm not. Or why didn't you tell me? Or whatever, you know? At least you deal with it. You don't wait until the person gets married. Right? And you heard the preacher say, Whatever God has joined together, and he said man, he didn't even say woman, right? He said, let no man put us on, that man means humankind. So the point is, it's too late, there are times that it's too late to express your love. Amen, light? Since you guys are not saying amen, I got to, Yes. Put the question back up, please. Thank you. Pastor, the question said that after the man got married, he revealed to the woman that he had feelings for her. So I think the man is just off. I'm, I'm reading the question, right? I've, over 30 years that yeah. he has always had romantic feelings for her. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I hope this wasn't true, but he needs to be checked. There's no way Reginald's going to go tell Joaquitima that he had feeling after he's been married to me. I, I, Reginald got issues. So that's just what I'm <laughs> Maybe you need to kill Reggie. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. What were your thoughts saying? Yes, uh, she kindled me to go ahead and ask this question. Um, you're on, you're on. I am? Yes. Okay. What's his you motivation? You have to hurry up, though. What's <laughs> what would be his motivation? That's we don't know. What's uh, it's, just, it's just not right. Is it just to clear his conscience, or is he after, is he really getting Yeah. Well, I think at the at the point Oh, yeah. Yeah, so somebody has a question, right? I I think originally the question had to do with um uh, adultery, right? Because the Bible says, right, if a man is lusting after a woman, he's already committed adultery in his heart. Okay. But the fact that they are friends and he's confessed this now to the woman what is the woman's responsibility? We know that the man has committed adultery, but because they've been friends for 30 years, what part, if any, does, is the woman's response, his friend of 30 years, what, what part is, is their responsibility? That's, that's, really, that's really was the question. If, if a man is married, for, forget that he's married. If a man is in a, I mean, if they're friends for 30 years, mm -hmm. and then after that 30-year period of time, um, the man d gets married, and then he, he reveals that he has feelings. Okay, we, he's already committed adultery in his heart because now he's interested or he has confessed that he has feelings, loving feelings towards yes. another woman. Yes, But now his friend, right, what is her responsibility? The woman? What is the woman's responsibility? Is she in sin because he's in sin, or if, can, do they continue no. the relationship? No, no. Okay. Because, uh, again, I think you probably know more about the question, Okay. But maybe you can clarify some things for me, okay? Because there was no understanding that the woman made the move. No. Was understanding that the man made the move. Okay, so the man is the one who is married. 
the man who is married is the one that has the most responsibility. Okay, in other words, I don't have responsibility for how you feel about me. Amen. Okay, that's your problem. Amen. Okay, uh, especially when it is inappropriate. Yes. Okay, that's why sometimes when you say everybody that comes to church, you should pay attention to what you came here to do, could be a dangerous statement. Because not everybody is here with pure motive. Okay, so it's really important that we don't put blame on the woman who did not express any kind of feeling for the man for over 30 years. Amen. Now, if you had 30 years to express your feeling, you didn't, you pursued somebody else. Yes, yes. And it sounds like a little case of have your cake and eat it too to me. Because it, after it was all said and done, then he expressed his romantic feelings. So he kind of didn't, he kind of got in the safety zone and then he started yeah. expressing himself. Well, again, you know, my point is, my point is this. We all know, at least I think, we all know it's an inappropriate statement. Do you think he would have said that in front of his wife? then it is not something you should say. And it's not something you should pursue. Yes. Yes. But then I also think, so woman's responsibility, the friend's responsibility would be the same. I would respect that friend, and my friendship with him would change. I would no longer have the same friendship that I had with that man of 30 years. And so I think I would set up some boundaries. Okay. Uh, there was another information that was given to me that, their relationship was not like we see every week or we see every month. It's every now and then. Okay. But, you know, I think it's really important that we set boundaries. Okay. Set boundaries, especially if you're married. Because it's very easy. It's very easy. Number one, uh, you don't marry everybody you love. Or you'll be in deep trouble. So it's really important that we control the relationship. And the man has responsibility and the woman also has the responsibility. But there are some people that are, that are raised in some backgrounds that don't think that a certain relationship is out of bounds. And if that happens, it's really important for the responsible party to say, this is out of bounds. Amen. Or the wife says, I don't know how you were raised, but I don't want you talking to her. Mm -hmm. Or I don't want you talking to him. Okay. Yes. Okay. I just want we'll to take one more after this and we have to move on. I just wanted to say you, Gina brought up a good point, the boundaries. Before my husband and I got married, we both have friends of the opposite sex. And so when we decided to get married, we made sure to talk to our friends of the opposite sex and say, you know, I have a fiance, he has a fiance. The boundaries are you can't come in me with feelings or try to, you know, get me in bed or whatever. That's no longer possible. So either you're going to respect the boundary or we can no longer be friends. And I find out that helped me in my relationship is boundaries are very important. Yeah, that's, again, when you're married, when you're married, everything changes. Because you're in a covenant. Marriage is a covenant. And you cannot break that covenant for anything. Unless you want the covenant broken, which is lead to divorce. And God hates divorce. So you don't want to do anything to uh, uh, encourage that. Yes. Yeah, I was just going to say um, that lady. That lady knew that he that 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 this man had feelings for her for thirty years. How do you know that? <laughs> oh, but because but she didn't she didn't take it she didn't take it to that to that limit. So therefore, that's why the friendship always stayed a friendship. She was she knew the whole time that that man wanted to okay. get at her. 
Come on now. That's what that's why that's why the, that's why the friendship stayed for 30 years because she didn't she didn't allow herself to uh to jeopardize the friendship. But he knew she knew the whole time and then when they got married, he could finally tell her which is inappropriate, but he could finally tell her how he feel and she probably said, "I knew Do you I, know I the guy?" That. No. You know the woman? No. Then you are assuming too much. <laughs> Okay, now, this is really important. I think in relationship, please don't assume anything. It's really important not to assume because you may have friends that are friends and the relationship can be pure. But you wouldn't know what a person is thinking unless you're God or unless they have shown signs. And if somebody has shown sign to you and you don't buy it and you went somewhere else to buy your goods, then you don't need to be talking to them. You know, it's, it's, it's a real, yes. I'll, I'll let my wife speak because she... <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't going to disagree with you. I was kind of, I was going to agree with Carlos because... Women, we have we have this this um, this antenna. We know when somebody is made some kind of. They don't even have to say a word. We can pick up body language. We can pick up different things. So to say that after 30 years she saw nothing, I don't believe it either. Because okay, she, I think she chose not to respond to it or whatever. But I agree with him that okay. she that she's got some sign. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let me, let me respond to that, though, because it's really important that everybody understand what I'm telling Carlos, okay? All I'm telling Carlos, Carlos, please listen. I'm dealing with your issue, okay? All, all I'm telling you is don't assume anything in relationship. Bring it to the open, okay? If you think... Well, again, they had relationship that they both agreed with for 30 years. Okay? Once that person got hooked, okay, in human beings, you don't have two hooks unless you live in Africa. Okay? You only have one hook. If you hook somebody, you're no longer available. They shouldn't bring it up anything. It doesn't matter what the woman knows, what the antenna the woman has, and everything. It, it, you know, you you know that relationship is over. Yes. I was just gonna say, even if. Even if you think you know, sometimes you don't know. That's why I'm agreeing with you, just because I think we can assume that somebody likes you, but then you go to them like, I know you like me, until they're like, uh, <laughs> no, I don't. So so I, I just think that unless somebody says something, and especially if a man is supposed to be pursuing, if he doesn't say anything, I, I don't think it means anything. You don't like me enough to say that you like me, so. In fact, thank you. Did I raise her well? <laughs> well, I really believe, I really believe it's respect for the woman. It's respect for the woman. Anybody that's married and you've been friends with them before they got married, and after they got married, they're still expressing something to you, they're disrespecting you. Well, you should slap them. <laughs> it's, it's bad. You had all this opportunity. Huh? Trente on. That's, that's the way the French will say. 30 years. Well, they both had the opportunity. They both had the opportunity. 
okay, friendship, friendship. I, I have friendship with God. Okay, let, let me say something. There are some people that said, don't confuse me with the facts. I already made up my mind. You are not going to learn from me. If that is your attitude. Okay, don't assume anything about anybody. And don't assume any relationship. If it is not expressed to you, it's not there. Oh, but he wrote me a nice letter. So what? The devil writes a nice letter every day. That doesn't make him your friend. If somebody respects you and they love you, they will express it for God's sake in 30 years. That's ridiculous. <laughs> You, if you are a Christian, if you have romantic feelings, that's wrong. You need to kill it. Okay, that's what Christianity is. Especially when it is in the wrong time, at the wrong place, for the wrong situation. Okay, let's go to question number three. Do we still have time? Okay, we have time for one more question. Okay, let's read it. Oh, okay. Go back. Go back. everybody get it? Okay. Number one, I know it's not written in the Bible, thou shalt not live with a woman you're not married to. Or thou shalt not live with a man you're not married to. Okay. Let's have that as the background. If you find it in there, you're lying. It's not in the Bible. But one thing is certain. We call it Christian ethics. Basically, Christian ethics says if you are a man and you have feelings for a woman and you want to live with that woman before you're married, that is not correct. You can swear, swear up and down all you want. You're going to be doing things that you should not be doing if you have feelings for each other. And that is why it is not good for you to be together. And that is based on lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's number one. And there's no argument with that. We don't have a specific passage that says, if you're not married to X, you should not live with X. If you're not married to Y, you should not live with Y. But the Christian principle says, if you have feeling for the person, you should not live with them until you're married. If you find something else in the Bible that contradicts that, raise your hand. Temptation is very real, especially if you capture it in your house. Yeah. 
Yes. So, Pastor, I know I heard what you just said about the Bible states that um, it doesn't clearly say a, a woman should not cohabitate or live with. I won't say what you didn't say, live with or vice versa. But it, it talks about fornication. Isn't that the same thing? And I was looking at Galatians. I was looking at Galatians um, five nineteen. Fornication and is an act. Okay. That includes the male organ and the female mm -hmm. organ. Okay. You can live in a house without. That is true. Fornication. Sexual intercourse. Right. Okay. Because you cannot really commit fornication unless you define fornication as adultery. Which, in case you can f you can commit adultery by just thinking of it, okay. So if you don't define it that way, and and I didn't go into the Greek word to try to express it, but what I'm saying is, when you're living with somebody, there's there are other cultures where people don't marry and they stay together, and it's understood in the in the community, and it is an accepted form in the community where it's not that the woman is living by the man alone. Okay, it's a community agreement and it's a cultural thing. Okay, um, an example is Mary and Joseph. Okay, there was, uh, they were not married, but they were, you know, engaged to be married. But they had so close relationship that when Mary came up pregnant, Joseph could have divorced her. Okay, but because of her character and because of what happens, uh, he uh, did not do that. Okay, that's a cultural thing. Okay, if, if you're a Christian or not, in America, they call that shacking up. You don't have to be saved to know what shacking up is. And shacking up provides a lot of <laughs> a lot of opportunity. Now, if a man says, I have feeling for this woman, number one, my question is, why do you want to go marry her right away? What's, what's holding you from just getting benefits without marriage? Unless the woman doesn't want to marry you. And the man doesn't want to marry you. If they don't want to, why live with them? It doesn't make any sense. When you see people in this type of relationship, it shows you the way they're thinking. They're not thinking right. Yes. No, I didn't say that. To live together means you're sharing everything. And that's what marriage is. And if you're not married, you shouldn't be doing that. If you're doing it, don't tell people you're from Village Baptist Church. <laughs> yes. So what if you're, you're living together? It's not on. It's on. Huh. Okay, now it's on. Okay, if you're living together and you have child, and you do get married. Number one, you're living together, you got a child, that's a problem. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You did something to get a child. Of course. Yeah. But you were, you were living together, you had, you had child, and then you married. You did it backwards. Yeah, again, you're right, you're getting it backwards. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, is that? The marriage should come before the child. Exactly, but say that it did happen, though, the child came before marriage. The child came then you marry. Once you're married, you can do whatever you want. As long as it's within the marriage covenant. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Yes. Well, yeah, you don't repent by living together. Yeah. 
He doesn't have to marry you to be forgiven. Yeah, again, I understand, but what I'm saying is forgiveness is the act of God. It's not your act. Just because you got married doesn't mean you're forgiven. You ask for forgiveness, and immediately God promises forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's his promise. You don't need marriage for that to happen. I have witnesses. <laughs> and it's taped also. You can get a copy. <laughs> yes. That's correct. It's just like me coming to you and slapping you. And said, I'm sorry. Right? And I walk a step and I feel like I want to do it again. <laughs> and I looked at you and I distracted you and then I went again. Whoa. <laughs> well, repentance is, the word repentance in Greek is the word metanoia. Uh, M A T A N O I A. Okay, and uh, I'll write it for you in Greek after church. Okay, but basically, what that means is to do an about face. Metanoia means you're going in the wrong place. You re it's more like a U turn. Okay, you realize you're going in the wrong place and you ask for God for forgiveness and you turned around. You don't ask for forgiveness if your intention is to continue to go the wrong way. That's what metanoia is. So you repent in order to stop going the wrong way. And sin actually uh, in the sense of it in Hebrew is the word that is translated to miss the mark. So sin is actually missing the mark. The mark is here. You know how people throw darts to uh, a board? Okay. It's like you're trying to hit it, okay, and you miss the point that you are. But in the actual Hebrew uh, drama, it doesn't mean that. It means this is the mark here, and you missed it because instead of throwing this way, you're throwing that way. You're not even aiming at what God asked you to do. You're doing your own thing. You will never meet the mark. Okay, yes. Uh, I, no, we have, uh, yeah, give it to uh, Brother Dan. Uh Everybody's talking about the, the man and woman thing, and I think it's kind of came over from the last question, but we completely ignored the fact that Rodney just stopped going to church, too. Uh, okay. I mean, we know the arrangement with the, with his girlfriend, and we know that that's really not okay as a Christian, but he isn't, I mean, is she not a Christian? I mean, I, I can only assume that she's not a Christian also because he just basically stopped going to church, right? He only yeah. goes on Christmas, Mother's well, Day, and other special events. Well, I don't. He, he well. stopped going to church as a as a as a grown up. You know, like we all know that some of us grew up, our parents telling us go to church, yeah. right? And you just go. And some of us were baptized, and nothing happened to us, but we just got wet. Okay, <laughs> but you have to get to a point in your life that you make your decision that I want to be a Christian. It's not what my father told me or my mother told me. It has to be something that I do. I have to take action and say, I want to follow Jesus. That's really when you become a Christian. It's not because you were baptized sometimes. 
You know, it doesn't matter. The devil can be baptized. It doesn't mean the devil is saved. Okay. Now, the point is, Rodney goes only special occasions. And if you're going to church only on special occasions, it's very clear you don't have a relationship with Jesus. And thank you for bringing that up. Because that's a very important point. If you're attending church only because there's a drama going on, or it's Mother's Day, it's Christmas, it's Easter, or something like that, uh, you're what I call the CME church goer, okay? Uh, you don't have a relationship with Jesus. And uh, going to church really doesn't make you a Christian. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Being in a garage does just turn you into a car. Okay? It doesn't happen that way. You have to make a decision that you want to follow Jesus. You want to accept him as your Lord and Savior. That's what makes you a Christian. All right. Yeah, okay, Mark. Uh, you're talking about now this man could get saved during one of these special occasions. Correct. So if he becomes a Christian, he's going to look at his behavior there, and he's going to change it. Correct. So that's that's the point. I think is he a Christian or not? Why or not? I think the why not is because he hasn't changed his behavior. He hasn't repented of his sin and made things right with the woman he was living with. Yeah. I, thank you. I, I, he can never really make things right with the woman he's living with. He can only make things right with God. Right. And if he doesn't make things right with God, you can't do it with anybody else. Exactly. That your vertical relationship has to be right before your horizontal relationship becomes correct. Thank you. Yeah. All right. We have five more, but we're going to let them go. Isn't God good? All the time. You know, you know the one thing about this is it shows that we are all imperfect. If you think about this question very well, if you look at it, we have some questions in here that even deals with the way you forgive people. If you think any of this does not apply to you, you are lying. But it's good to know that we serve a merciful God who is always not just providing a second chance, but he wants to give you a better life. And that's what God is about, a better life. And uh, to all men, all men, all men, I want to say this. Don't live with a woman you're not married to. That's not the plan of God for you. And to the women here, those of you that are single, don't let a man stay with you if he's not willing to marry you. Amen. If he's willing to marry you, we won't be discussing this. You'll be married. A man that wants to stay with you is saying a lot about himself. Yeah. And he's showing you red flags. Yeah. Run. I mean, you have to be faster than Jesse Owen. <laughs> okay? That's the, that's the wrong man for you. Good men will be committed to you. Amen. They won't date you for 40 years. 